Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to Big Bannon's Blacksmithing, our first video of me forging out uh, some of my historic knives. In this video we'll be focusing on, as you saw in the title, an Iron Age knife. Uh, that is from Glastonbury Lake Village. It's a dagger. Um, this particular one will be made of wrought iron. And for this video we're going to actually focus on uh, just the metalwork. Um, although this one will end up with a handle on during the video, I'm not really going to show that, I'm just going to show the basic forging, hammer hardening, filing, the dressing of the knife uh, to have that end finished product. I'll do another video for putting on handles of knives at another time. This uh, time with self-isolation and COVID-19, it's all good time to have a bit of fun and experiment. We'll intend to um, put some, get some better filming equipment, so I apologise for the quality of the video. It's not the greatest at the moment, especially with a scratch lens on a camera. So we'll uh, eventually get some better equipment that can also deal with the glare of the fire and the heat in the knife as well. So you're seeing we're getting a, a good heat on this bar. We're starting off with a 16 square, 16 mil square bar of wrought iron. Um, this is from an old uh, piece of fencing. Um, and working this one we've found if you work on one side it's okay but if one of the other faces unless you've got it incredibly hot uh, it tends to delaminate as you forge so always trying to get this up to a very high temperature once we've got it we kind of roll with it keep that heat going um, forging at a point now I don't normally start uh, a knife or a dagger like this I've decided instead just to taper down the entire 16 mil square but I usually just set down flat enough a section and from that flat section forge out forge out a knife or a dagger but this one I've kept at almost its full 16 I'm working down a long taper um, out of this bar to hopefully quite quickly turn it into a, a double sided dagger from the Iron Age So slowly flattening it out, as I say, you can't really see as much detail as what's going on due to the glare of the metal, and sorry for that again, we will get some better filming equipment to deal with that. But you can see I'm slowly working down. For people who are learning blacksmithing, and those who may have been on some of my courses, or those who are just watching this to maybe get a better idea, do look how I am hammering that uh, long section. I'm not putting it on the anvil and hammering up and down its length. I am hammering in one spot on the anvil and drawing the metal through under the hammer. Your anvil faces a different shape entirely across it, so if you place the metal over and hammer in different spots, you'll never get it even. However, if you hammer in one spot and draw the metal through, you can actually get very cleanly forged work. And that's what I always try to do. I try to forge my knives to completion as close as I can get and again as clean as possible so that I don't have to remove as much material basically try for no wastage so slowly get in there with a nice taper I'm also ensuring we've got a distal taper on this the distal taper means it continuously tapers in thickness all the way to the end so down at the base where the tang will be the blade itself apart from being its widest will also be its thickest and then there'll be a continual taper all the way down in thickness as well as width just quickly measuring there we see we're aiming for about 138 millimeters uh, in length that's the length of the original and the blade the original has about 39 40 millimeters in width maximum thickness of the blade itself is 3.8 mil at its widest point. This particular style of dagger is actually, uh, we get a few examples across the country, some of them I'm not entirely convinced are daggers. There's a uh, similar example that's found up at the Scottish Cranach Centre at Loch Tay. Um, I forged a replica of that of what the remains were, the tang itself was only about 40 millimeters long, whereas the tang on this one, the uh, surviving example, has a 10 centimeter tang, 100 mil tang, 
Um, and we know for certain this one was a dagger because the butt end of the tang has actually been hammered. It's been upset to form that uh, peened end to hold a handle on. Handle itself rotted away. We don't know what material was on the original. Uh, but it does seem that it was all organic. There's no uh, other metal fittings, uh, whether it's a, a copper alloy or anything like that. There's no other metal fitting. So on this one, I'll be keeping the handle completely made of organic materials. So we've got our nice long spike, our long taper, and now I'm hammering on its edges. I'm hammering them flat on the anvil and I'm just twisting my tongue slightly, raising it up. And for a double sided blade, we don't need to do a counter curve, but what's quite important, you don't necessarily have to do it this way, but is to count your hammer blows on each side as you work and try to hit the same number of times using similar heats on all sides to try and keep it progressing evenly up. This is putting the bevel or the chamfer, the cutting edge of the knife on. Some people, when they're forging double-sided blades with diamond cross sections, they will forge all four sides. You can as well, flipping it over and then uh, reversing sides of the anvils. Um, I tend to work, uh, especially when I'm working water, and I work only two sides just by giving them, as you see here, a flip after each run. And as long as you've got the angle correct, as long as you've got it steady and firm, you can usually produce that nice diamond cross section on the blade. The original may have had it. From the archaeology, we can't quite tell. It seems to have uh, become rounded, whether that was over time of uh, sharpening, of use. Uh, I'm not too sure. Um, blades in the Iron Age in Britain, I can certainly say, they do have a mixture. There are even with swords as well, you have swords and daggers that are, and spears of course, that are diamond, lenticular, and some are just flat bars with sharpened edges. Um, so only when you're reproducing exact is there a right or wrong way, but the reality is almost every example has um, a different example of a cross section to it. Don't normally hit the edges of swords and daggers when forging out. I only do that when I usually have messed up and I've hit some part a little bit too hard or unevenly, so just trying to remove a bit of the curve. Again now, still widening out the chamfer, the cutting edge of this blade. We're aiming for a total blade width of 39 to 40 mil. Uh, at its widest point. However, with this process and it being raw iron, I'm not going to take it completely out to 40 mil just yet. I want to leave some thickness in those edges. Uh, very important as that will contribute a lot to the work hardening stage um, where we make this blade tougher. Um, the I am using raw iron for this as I say um, if it has any carbon in it whatsoever it's incredibly low with this example and usually that means things like quenching won't make a huge difference so we're not going to bother with quenching or tempering or anything like that with this this blade itself will be made stronger by being cold worked in a similar way that mild steel grass cutting sides are sharpened and hardened even today um, on the edge of a small anvil hammering the edges as we'll see later you could do this as well with mild steel. Mild steel is actually a fairly decent um, replacement for raw iron in the Iron Age. It's not incorrect. There are some very mild steel metal swords. Um, it's quite often thought that in the Iron Age, most people think, well, because it's called the Iron Age, there's no steel. When reality shows tests from people like Janet Lang and um, Vanessa uh, Vanessa Fell and Radha McPlenia show across the uh, 
Celtic region, Celtic Europe, um, Britain and continental Europe, swords, daggers, spears, range even from the early Iron Age from having everything from no carbon whatsoever all the way through to having high carbon of usually up to 0.87%. So we're good, high carbon steel there. When iron is used quite typically it seems to be quite high in phosphor um, and there are examples of swords having been quenched with no tempering, some are quenched with tempering, some are then just left to air cool uh, and there's a few examples as well where the edges have been hammer hardened. So that's the technique as I say we're selecting for this. forged out the blade, quite happy with how that's gone now, and uh, we're just chiseling and cutting off. This is why I like iron, iron's so soft and easy to cut and work with. You just have to watch out for, of course, the metal delaminating if you don't get it hot enough as you forge. And today sometimes it can be a bit hit and miss what quality iron you have, um, usually if we end up with some rubbish iron we will just like smiths throughout its history forge it out fold it over weld it back together create a new grain structure maybe even weld a bit of mild steel into it as well we have examples of uh, laminated iron and steel blades in the iron age we have ones where they have been forged together with basically wrought iron, medium carbon steel and high carbon steel all sandwiched together to form swords where one edge is of a medium carbon and one, the other edge is high carbon. So they weren't clueless about what they were doing, they are actually incredibly good smiths. And they are already using steel, whether they knew it as steel they just saw it probably as a harder, much stronger iron perhaps, but they certainly could identify it and use it to better effect. That's not to say every single sword and knife was amazing. It's certainly about 33% of the swords that have been tested that show that they were of uh, much lower quality than the other 66. And there's plenty of knives where they have been tested and they show basically to have a hardness rating of only about 23 Rockwell, not very high at all. However, if you're just using it for cooking, for cutting veg, that's all you need, you don't need a super tough blade. So forging out the tang now, we've put in a step down um, on the edge of the anvil and now we need to get this uh, tang out to about 11 centimeters, 110 millimeters. When I was doing this I actually um, yeah, work that tang a little bit, it twisted onto the uh, bad face of this iron and started to delaminate. So what you saw at the very beginning there with a few sparks was me just trying to heat up the end till a welding temperature and just gently weld that delamination back together again. I think I have to do it a couple of times over the course of forging this knife, especially as we get to a thinner section on this tang. I work it a little bit too cold a couple of times and then have to weld it back together a tad. When forging historic blades I've actually found quite often that using my reproduced tools, so right now the tongs I'm holding this with are actually an iron pair of tongs that I made from a grave from Danebury Hillfort. Um, and I actually find those along with, I'm not using it today, but an iron hammer I forged out. Um, I copied again from Danebury, uh, but there's a similar example from Fiskerton, Causeway in Lincolnshire. Um, I actually find they work perfectly for making all the Iron Age equipment, as well as working not on a London pattern anvil, which I have here, but even just a Ted Rand styled off Iron Age ones. It all works perfectly together. Um, I've even forged a sword off an anvil no more than two inch square. Uh, and I actually found it easier than doing it on a larger anvil, oddly enough.
So we're picking Glastonbury Lake Village currently as a uh, site to uh, go over the archaeology and reproduce many of the metal items from it. As I said, the hammer and the um, tongs are examples from Danbury Hillfort, and although there's lots of prime examples at Danbury, what's brilliant about Glastonbury Lake Village is, of course, many of the items have fallen into the silt and the mud of the river and have actually become quite well preserved, even having cases of bill hooks and adzes where the handles are still present on, uh, on the uh, tool, so we know exactly what materials they were using. For this particular knife, I'm actually going to put on a piece of ram's horn and an antler handle. I used to shy away from antler handles, but having looked over again more of the finds from Glastonbury, we find that there's actually a huge amount of antler being used. Some of it worked fantastically into nicely decorated handles. Same again for Fiskerton, um, where we have various tools like files with, again, antler handles decorated again as well. So picking these materials to try and coincide with uh, uh, handles from other examples at the time. Ram's horn I'm favouring as well a lot the, at the moment, finding that quite a few of the Iron Age swords in Britain have handles made of uh, sheep horn. And ram's horns are certainly a good way to find certainly a good way to find um, a horn piece big enough and consistent enough to make a knife handle with. I try to avoid the using buffalo horn and just claiming it's black cow horn. I try to avoid that as best as I can. It might be passable at times, but oh no, and if I can find the right material, I like to use the right material. They think that it looks like my fire is far away and having to reach quite a bit, that's because it is. We've recently moved into a workshop where the forge is from the 17th century and is currently falling down, We're having it rebuilt, um, and currently the only working hearth is on the other side of the forge and where I'm not set up, where my colleague forges from instead. Um, but eventually we will have both halves working. We're also going to be switching over from using an electric fan as our blower and actually having large double action bellows behind which we're also currently refurbishing a pair of them to work. Our ideal is also would be to use charcoal. I'm using coal on the fire. Um, it's a decent fuel, however I would much rather prefer charcoal at the moment, although price means we can't use it, but with charcoal it would be a lot easier to allow it to soak an iron blade and potentially take up some carbon into it and convert it into a mild steel or even a carbon steel, as we find with some examples, although that does take a very long time. With the coal we've got to be careful because you can absorb sulfides into the blade sulfur into the blade and I can make it brittle. So as the tanks forged out you've got to be careful just like with forging out the blade You've got to be careful that you don't overheat any one bit. Iron is quite resistant to breaking apart in the fire. Um, however, it can still just drop off if you do get that metal too hot. So you do want to watch out for that. Just trying to tidy up the transition as well. The 
between the tang and the blade. The original example has a quite a sharp transition, which I'm trying to get as close as I can, but this is going to need some firework to tidy it up. So you'll see it miraculously change at some point, because frankly you don't want to sit and watch me file that down for a good 20 minutes. I'm trying to do this blade itself with no power tools uh, where I can avoid it. I think the only power tool I do use is a uh, power drill to drill the pilot holes for the handle um, and I use hand files to widen it and fit it. Aside from that I don't use any power tools on this and this is all done by hand with hand files as well which again they did have in the Iron Age. People tend to think that, no, no, it's the Iron Age, they can't have files. We've got ample examples of them from Glastonbury Lake Village, Danebury Hill, Fort Fiskerton Causeway, up in Yorkshire as well, in some of the grave finds. Basically, all over the country as well as on the continent. So, the forging of the blade is pretty much finished. Just doing a few last checks to make sure everything's in line. And we'll let this cool down. We won't quench it because if you quench it it makes hammer hardening very difficult and in fact can cause the blade to break because it work hardens much too quickly then. Um, so we're just going to let it cool down before we start on the hammer hardening. Okay, so we've let this cool. I filed the edges a little bit to tidy them up. And as you see, while working cold, we're lining the edge up against the edge of the anvil and doing glancing blows. First, we're hitting quite firm right on the cutting edge. Now, this blade currently is about two, two and a half millimeters thick at its edges. And the typical rule for hammer hardening is for every millimeter you reduce the blade's thickness by, it will harden it by half of what it was. So if it was, let's say, 20 Rockwell, and we reduce it by a millimeter in thickness, it should, in theory, have gone to 30 Rockwell in harden. You can see the blade is getting that nice uh, sheen to it, getting that bit of shine. That's where we've struck. And this blade isn't at 40 millimeters wide yet, it's a little under, because as I do this, this blade will widen out to that desired size. And you can use this time as well, while doing it, to make the edges very clean with overlapping hammer blows. The first run of hammer hardening you'll actually do, you'll find that the edges of blade become quite wavy, because the material might not be the exact uh, uniform thickness all the way along, it might vary as it goes along quite a bit, uh, and so you'll find parts of it will pop out wider than others. That's because this is the first run, this will actually quite, uh, will usually equalize everything. It's quite a tiring process, but it will equalize everything, um, and we will file it back, and then give it another run, and that will be the run that will move closer to putting a cutting edge on. You find it will become quite smooth. Just as before, we want to make sure we flip it and work both sides. We are actually going to work all four sides on and do this by switching round over onto the other side of the anvil as well. I usually find this easier on a smaller anvil. Um, sometimes I bring my small uh, block anvil that I use for historic blacksmithing displays. Sometimes I bring that into this workshop to do this process. As I said, you don't want to have quenched this blade. Ideally, you never want to quench, uh, quench it unless you have to. Um, any work, really. You want to just let it air cool unless you have to quench it for whatever reason. But if I had quenched this, it would become incredibly difficult to do this process. It does toughen the blade. Not well enough with this iron, in this case of the iron, to hold a decent cutting edge. But it would make it a lot more difficult to work this material out. Raw iron will have a top 
hardness it, but it won't ever be as hard or hold as good a cutting edge as say a modern chef's knife out of carbon steel but again at what stage you actually then need this iron to do that I have a um, mild steel knife that surely can't be harder than about 40 odd Rockwell um, and I use that blade for everything from buttering animals, working bone, carving wood I've used it for everything and it works perfectly fine yep I have to sharpen it occasionally and if I ever feel it's not hard enough I give it a run like this on an anvil making that edge harder and we're actually testing to see using hammer hardening as a form of sharpening as well just as I said before they still use this actually today on sides for grass cutting um, in the US actually cutting your lawn using a side grass scythe has actually become quite a popular hobby but usually you give your scythe made of mild steel a quick run over like this and you can bring knives and tools like that to a sharp cutting edge we're not going to go as far as that primarily I'm doing this to harden the blade and also just to work out any mistakes I made in the forging if anything's not quite level, not quite as exact as I would like we'll try and bring the material out so we're nearly there I need to file the edges. You can see how smooth the metals become actually with that sheen. So now I've filed the edges. You see we've brought it down to more the shape that uh, this blade is going to be. And now I'm focusing a lot more on its cutting edge. As opposed to trying to bring the material from the middle, I'm now really focusing on that cutting edge to thin them out. I switched to a glove because it was jarring my hand a little bit. You do want to try and work it quite evenly. You'll see that the tip has curved, just like any tiny bevel or chamfer a blade. It will make it curve. So we want to flip it over. We want to flip it over, work the other side, and bring it level again. This time, after the first run, having filed it down, you'll actually find that the edge, as long as you keep your hammer blows quite controlled, you'll find that the edge. It doesn't become as wavy and you can progress more evenly along this. This is where actually a distal taper in the metal is incredibly important because if you haven't got that taper, no matter how pointed you make the tip, it will always just splurge out again and go wide and you'll lose that blade shape. You'll lose that point as it becomes more like a spatula or a spoon. So that distal taper with less metal at that tip to work out. That's really important, especially for this process as well. Certainly as we're not making a shovel. Someone once said to me that the uh, Le Ten style swords with their rounded tips, they're only good for digging out the ground. Of course, I can't control what you do in your own workshops, but wear ear defenders for this. It does wear on you after a while, and frankly, there's nothing wrong with wearing PPE. If you need to wear gloves, wear gloves. If you need to wear, but I always say wear specs. And I would always advise defenders, ear defenders, as well. You can see that uh, diamond cross section coming out quite well now, especially after the hammer hardening. I've tidied up those edges. It's got a bit of a curve in him, so we need to work him out a bit more on the 
inside of that curve. It's not far off completion now. Next stage will then again be to file those edges. Make sure any slight wavy shape to it has been brought down, made it nice and uh, straight and even. And then on this example I am going to file the faces of the blade. Normally I would actually leave it for an Iron Age blade. We do have examples of some swords showing file marks where they may have been polished. Um, and yet absolutely it's certainly a status symbol of sword as well so you would want that to look shiny however it is definite that some of the swords we find in the archaeology are definitely not as expensive as we think um, they're almost no more than a plank of iron sharpened on the edges and with a sheep's horn stuck on the end they're nothing impressive but they're still swords whether they have been polished up we don't know something to do if you're bored I suppose but something like this, a blade I would normally leave and just sharpen his edges after this especially personal blades that you use for domestic tasks there's almost very little reason to have it polished especially as iron especially as how quickly it could rust you cut an apple once with that blade it's already going to turn grey it almost becomes a pointless affair trying to polish it up unless of course you're really trying to show off and maybe only certain items were So it needs a bit of a file on the sides, just making sure we've got the tang in line. I'll say this works for mild steel and wrought iron. Don't do this with a carbon steel, it would have snapped well before this point now. I'm curious as to whether it will work with EN8 tool steel. I doubt we'd be able to push it as far as this, but I have a nice section of that, so I might give it a go. Modern EN8 tends to not have as much carbon as it, can, it used to have in it. It used to go up to 0.4. Typically now though it seems to only be about 0.3% if, if that. So uh, I don't have as much confidence in EN8 now as it used to. So that's what I mean with filing down. People keep saying to me when I, on courses, you know, oh, well, well, is it done yet? And I always say when filing that edge, if you if it's not all shiny, if it's not, that's how you know it's even because your file is uh, cleaning the edge of it. If you can see any spot of black or grey on there and not silver, then yeah, you still need to file it a bit more. The blade itself actually has a slightly curved transition, so although it looks currently like it's very pointed, um, it doesn't actually go down in a uh, very sharp taper, actually slightly bows inwards. A bit like the earlier Hellstadt daggers. So we've just softened that edge, just made it a bit more curved. Making sure we bring the tip of the blade inwards a bit more. Again, if people have skipped ahead and haven't heard me before, people crying out about files, as there's always people who do, um, we had them. We had them. I'll be making some soon, actually, some Iron Age files. Um, 
and the Iron Age peoples were able to control their hardness and bring them from again from slightly tougher wrought iron to mild all the way all the, all the way up to high carbon steels and we find them all across Britain um, in Glastonbury we certainly find a fair few different examples my favorite has to be from Fiskerton though um, which is a lovely rasp that's been forged beautiful antler handle that has been decorated as well so just filing down that transition between the tang and the blade try to avoid very sharp corners and I do even at this point I haven't actually uh, gone right into that corner and made it too sharp because it does create a weakness in the blade although it's only a short blade so it's not like we're parrying with this when fighting um, not typically the way to fight in the Iron Age so we're going to see magically a handle appear now onto the blade as we finish off polishing the edge using a file again trying to use the uh, diamond cross section to work in line with that chamfer focusing especially on bringing that cutting edge down as well we maybe have about half a millimeter material on the edge still after hammer hardening and filing him back a bit in this particular example if he becomes a bit rounded in his cross section it's not wrong to say in fact I think having looked at the archaeological example uh, drawings of the original I think actually a slightly rounded shape uh, more lenticular cross section would have been perhaps more correct and I might adjust this over time we'll see but this one will be filed to polish him up and then he'll actually have a run of uh, over wet stones, slate stones and sandstones to uh, bring it further. This file I was using was quite harsh so it's just doing a quick video. You can see the teeth marks in it but you can certainly see the shape a lot more. I'm protecting the handle in that cloth there. It's a very vicious looking dagger I've got to say and I'm always surprised at how similar um, well, the similarities between some of the tools and weapons from the Iron Age in Britain, how similar they are to some of those in Africa, still in use today. Indeed, we look at quite a few of those to get a better idea. As I said, this one, this particular example, we definitely know, or well, I'm pretty certain, that it was a dagger due to it having a peened tang. However, the example up in Scotland, uh, I actually reckon was perhaps a tanged spearhead, um, which wouldn't be unsurprising as in the Iron Age we don't have many finds of arrows, but at least half of the finds of arrows in Britain are actually tanged and not socketed. And it would seem right to me that the example from Scotland, which has a shorter blade and a much shorter tang, is in fact a spearhead. It would have certainly been a more economical use of metal up there uh, and around Lochte it doesn't actually seem that there was a vast amount of iron production so perhaps it wasn't as available couldn't quite say but making a tanged spearhead instead of a socket one seemed like it would save a lot of material So here we have it, we can see the antler and the horn handle, there's the blade, if you have any questions do comment below of course.